Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Robin de Moura. <laughs> Thank you already. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so today I will be the spokesperson for myself, but also Audrey Banex, uh, with whom we, we prepared this uh, talk together, but uh, who couldn't join, uh, unfortunately. So I will talk about uh, interdisciplinarity, uh, multitasking, and what working in the interdisciplinary research environments uh, does to decision-making processes and also uh, to open research tools development. So uh, the context I'm uh, speaking from is uh, a lab called the Media Lab of Sciences Po, which is uh, an interdisciplinary laboratory and which um, explores the relationships between digital technologies and uh, society. So this lab is made by uh, individuals who come from very different backgrounds, hence uh, the interdisciplinarity. Uh, but uh, this interdisciplinarity had ha has two uh, stakes, two scales, so to, uh, so to speak, because also each individual uh, is uh, himself or herself the spokesperson for a variety of uh, cultures, of intellectual interests, uh, and also of lines of expertise. So here is what these people look like. Here is where Audrey stands. And here is uh, where I stand. So all of these people do things together. Uh, and because or thanks to this diversity, uh, they, uh, they have variegated uh, activities. So they do social sciences inquiries, of course, but they also teach and produce tools, uh, whether they be uh, code libraries or off-the-shelf uh, applications. And often one person is involved in more than one of these activities. So they do these activities in a variety of contexts. Uh, some of them are clearly and precisely defined, like collectively, uh, uh, research, uh, collectively funded research projects. Uh, others, like uh, PhD research, for instance, uh, are more open-ended and have less defined uh, boundaries and uh, aims. So we build tools, papers, and experiments uh, for a variety of uh, publics. So first our colleagues and, uh, and fellow researchers, but also students and several professional groups uh, like library uh, specialists. Uh, all the activities we do are linked and uh, feed each other. And this talk will be a description of how at Media Lab we cope with this intertwining. Uh, it will focus on describing uh, what are the consequences and modalities of doing things in the same place and often with the same persons. Uh, underlying this description I will make uh, is a methodological reflection uh, for which I hope to foster some uh, discussion, uh, which is the fact that we all know methodologies coming from the industry uh, and or a software production culture like agile methods, UX research, UX design, the difference between proof of concept and the production ready products. Uh, but my question is uh, how do these established methods and labels uh, dialogue with uh, our specific research context? So to do so, the description will focus on uh, two nodes of methodological tension uh, and two sets of practices. The first one will be the question of writing in social sciences, and it will address the relationship between prototypes and products, research and development, or um, what it means to be at the same time the users and the makers of the software productions we make. Um, the second will be the question of uh, social inquiry on the web, and it will address uh, decision-making processes and, uh, the, um, the, and the question of how we cope with the separation of concerns and responsibilities uh, between individuals with, within uh, this, um, this interdisciplinary uh, context. So first, we'll, uh, we'll look at how tools making and experiments are intertwined and how the mix of contexts described before um, allows to trace a complex interweaving between uh, inquiry practices, experimentation, and uh, open research tools uh, stabilization, so to speak. So to situa situate this concern, I will uh, address the question of uh, writing uh, and publishing in social sciences, which is my privileged uh, area of, uh, of research and interest. Uh, so the past decade has been marked by uh, a lot of brilliant initiatives, technologies and tools uh, that try to establish new standards uh, to leverage digital, digital technologies in the service of better editorial processes, uh, of polymorphic publishing, but also sometimes to question what it means to write digitally um, as a social science researchers. So in that regard, Medialab has been structured since uh, its, uh, its uh, inception 
10 years ago uh, by the pedagogical activity of what we call uh, controversy mapping. So controversy mapping is a specific kind of uh, sociological inquiry uh, which consists in describing the different uh, point of view and uh, at stake in a social, uh, in a social technical uh, dispute or controversy, uh, like for instance, uh, ungrowth, uh, to, as you will see in the example I, I will show. Um, and uh, in these courses, students are asked to produce as outcome of, of uh, their websites, uh, of, of their research, sorry, not uh, reports, not papers, but websites. So why do we uh, ask them that? It's because by using hypertext, they are allowed to express the multiplicity of point of view uh, which uh, uh, controversy description requires. So first reason, hypertext. And the second reason is that it allows students to write closer to the inquiry documents that they use, for instance, images, interviews, uh, official documents, uh, by staging them directly inside the websites. So in parallel to, to, to this uh, activity, these pedagogical activities, Medialab was also uh, structured by the practice of datascapes, uh, which are research endeavors that consist in uh, building at the same time a data set, research questions, and a web publication which combines hypertextual navigation and uh, data visualization. So these two prior experiences gave practical, uh, gave practical and intellectual basis to another project in the lab called AIM. Uh, AIM stands for an inquiry into modes of existence. So it's a project grounded in, the, in uh, 30 years of field study uh, by a single researcher, which is called Bruno Latour. And this project consisted, among other activities, in creating uh, a platform allowing to read both the text written by Bruno Latour, but also to uh, browse the documents, uh, so videos, images, references uh, he gathered during his career um, and used to produce his arguments. The platform also allowed uh, readers to participate by proposing contributions in the same document-based writing mindset. So on this project, I was a PhD student at the time uh, in a situation of participant observation. And uh, with the designer of the project, uh, who is called Donato Ricci, we quickly started to think about ways to reuse and translate this platform, this structure, uh, or to fork it, uh, to fork its way of writing close to the materials to other research projects. For that, we, run, we wrote a grant request that asked funding to build an open source technology to do that, but it was rejected twice. Um, but it was not a big deal because at the same time, uh, I published the first results of my inquiry on the M project uh, in a co-written paper uh, with members of the team, so Donato Ricci, but also Christophe Leclerc and Bruno Latour. And it was not just an account of my results, but also an experimental format on itself, uh, based on what some call uh, the scroll telling, which means that things appear while you are scrolling and reading the article. And it was, so to speak, uh, a way to test some, uh, some ideas that we were before asking money for, but didn't have. Um, so this first uh, experiment was also the occasion of a uh, first technical uh, experiment, uh, a custom document generation system using Mardon and BibText um, languages to allow us, so as a team of co-writers, to directly write the article, but also its visualizations, specification, uh, and to iterate and collectively uh, interact uh, in this kind of, of writing. So in parallel in the lab, at the same time, controversy mapping courses uh, were scaled up because of their success. Uh, and this asked to develop an open source solution uh, to, uh, that would allow to build social sciences websites in an easier, in an easier way, uh, while not being captive of commercial platforms, uh, and also um, while mitigating te technological obsolescence uh, problems that we s saw arising with the uh, students' productions. Uh, so out of this, the team uh, made a, a solution which is uh, called Drive-In and which consists in allowing uh, to turn a Google Drive folder into a static website. So on my side, after having uh, left uh, uh, Media Lab to continue my PhD, I developed on my, on my side uh, and some processes, uh, I developed some of the processes I observed and tested around the M project. And uh, it came out as, a, as something called Peritext, which is a series of hypotheses about what document structures and, uh, and modes of presentation would address a better interweaving 
uh, between in empirical materials, uh, writing and scholarly publication, and to make a meaningful use of polymorphic, polyformat, contemporary context of scholarly publishing. I mean by that, uh, publishing on, a, uh, on the web, but also um, in a various edi editorial contexts. So to do that, uh, I wonder uh, what would be a thinking of writing at the contextualization of some resources uh, and I wondered what would happen if researchers had the opportunity to specify, uh, to specify more finely uh, those contextualizations and how they should look like depending on their position in the text but also depending on the output formats. A second hypothesis was to think about these resources uh, as all possible points uh, uh, of departure for writing activities instead of just considering texts, so chapters and sections, as uh, the backbone of what uh, uh, scholarly publishing could be. So this would allow to generate a variety of uh, additions for a given production uh, and to vary points of view uh, and the uh, roles for the documents uh, being produced depending on the research st stage or uh, its aim. So once I formulated this hypothesis, I wanted to, to test them, but that would have required the inside project of uh, creating yet another ecosystem of JavaScript uh, libraries. So I did it uh, and uh, st started to experiment uh, with this uh, at first. But after my, uh, so yeah, these are an example of the, the modules that are inside this ecosystem. So after my PhD funding uh, ended, I came back to Media Lab uh, to cope with the change of controversy mapping uh, scaling up. And this was eventually the occasion to actually test this uh, hypothesis uh, on a real use case. So out of this came Fonio, which is this time a collective effort, uh, and which is a collaborative editor, so open source, everything is open source is in wha what you see here, um, a collaborative editor allowing to write digital dissertations and download them as static websites. So it's built for social sciences in the sense that it allows to write footnotes, to use bibliographic references and a diversity of uh, resources. And it allows to write hypertextually through uh, interactive lexicon and uh, internal links. It also allows students to uh, design their websites uh, within the interface. So while doing that, my PhD continued. And um, at the same time, I, dev I developed a new editor called Ovid. Uh, which is a single user, more experimental and uh, advanced uh, test of the pretext hypothesis. So Ovid is uh, uh, turned towards practices which are not necessarily relevant for students, for instance, data visualization, but also advanced glossary production, like uh, entity definitions, so places, uh, a person, etc., etc. And it also allows um, to go further in the design of uh, the outputs and to create multiple editions, both, both for, screen, for screens and uh, printers. So these two, uh, these two projects, of course, were developed together and have a lot, of, uh, have, have a lot in common. Uh, but their code base uh, remain separated, mostly, uh, because they address different contexts and goals. So um, Fonio has been used by students, by more than uh, 2,000 uh, students by, uh, so far. Uh, and now they, they are uh, conducting and doing their own experiments on top of that uh, framework. And concerning Ovid, a document which happens to be my thesis uh, should uh, be out uh, someday soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, here's a production from the students. So, yeah. So now I will um, uh, zoom at a closer level. And rather than talking about temporal dynamics, I will focus on relation between people at stake in uh, tools development. How does the decision uh, about our tools evolution is made and implemented? <coughs> and for that, I will take the example of um, a software called uh, Hive Browser. But before um, speaking about it, I must speak about Hive. So for, for which uh, Hive Browser is a kind of uh, interface, if you want. So <coughs> Hive is a tool made for a very specific research um, practice, which embeds in its working a str strong methodological assumptions. It's a tool allowing researchers um, to build corpuses of web, of web page 
of web pages, sorry, about a specific topic. So for instance, I don't know, coronavirus or uh, palm oil. Uh, so the idea is that these web pages are selected and regrouped by researchers as web entities, which represents the different actu actors of the issues, so organizations, persons, uh, and then analyze the relationship between uh, actors through the relationships uh, between web pages corresponding to them. So it is quite quantitative in the sense that it allows researchers to manually uh, choose which websites uh, they want to add to their corpus, but also by analyzing the contents of these web pages to um, generate automatic processes to fetch new website su suggestions and then work iteratively between the machine and the, and the researcher. So now Hive Brother uh, in this quality quantitative frame is a student-oriented interface to Hive and it allows to browse the web while constituting the website's corpus. And students have a, have a way to both read the websites and see how their corpus evolves through uh, visualization. Sorry for my voice. Um, so after two years, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So after two years um, of uh, use, we decided that we should uh, uh, continue the, the development of the project and uh, make it evolve um, in harmony with uh, what it was used for. So to do that, uh, we started with a series of conversations with all the, uh, all the persons in contact with the app. So students, teachers, <laughs> but also engineers, researchers, and so on. So <clears throat> we discussed with them in which context they use Hive Browser. But we also, I also asked them to perform some activities while being interviewed and encouraged to explain what they were doing, understanding and feeling. So from that, <clears throat> a series of remarks were, uh, were um, uh, defined, then turned into cards and collectively discussed with all of the actors participating to, to that redesign. Um, out of this, uh, these discussions, uh, some uh, wireframes were made, and from this, uh, this wireframe, uh, uh, these uh, propositions came out new discussions and new iterations. So these meetings were interesting because they revealed the diversity of interests uh, and priorities within the lab. They allowed to carry a peaceful negotiation process but also to reveal the diverging attachments and concerns at hand in, in, in this process. So who are on this battlefield, which is the redesign meeting? Uh, we have the original designers or their spokesperson who uh, designed a clear methodology and its embodiment in the tool and don't want the tool to uh, risk to, to, to evolve in order to, to risk of confusing the initial methodological message, so to speak, that the tool is supposed to carry. We have also the developers who are worried about um, refactoring avalanches that would uh, uh, be triggered by uh, new propositions and evolutions of, of, of the tool. We have also, of course, the teachers who are using this in the classroom and they want to voice out non-conventional uses of the tool, such as for Hive Browser, teaching through the tool how search engines work, or using it as a tool for building uh, scholarly cytographies uh, formatted in the uh, complying bi bibliographical uh, norms. We have also researchers who use the tool, even if it's made for students initially, and they want to be able to discuss and twitch methodological embeddings in the tool. We have specialists. Um, who bring their also their strong archive, archiving culture and background to the discussion. <coughs> and last but not least, we have what I call mediators. So people aimed, uh, who, whose role is to promote, explain, document, and who are actually articulating the tool with different practical contexts. So two remarks about this, uh, this situation. First is that these mediating roles are quite important to allow distributed ne negotiation uh, concerning the evolution of the tool. But second is also that several persons that you see listed here are in multiple positions. And this is the feature of an interdisciplinary uh, laboratory. And this is uh, 
very useful to mitigate misunderstanding and also to enhance dialogue between functions and responsibilities who are, however, not, not shared. Um, so, as a conclusion, developing from the field uh, means being situated in a diversity of uh, negotiation processes uh, between experiment and query and software stabilizations, but also between multiple interests, uh, interests uh, voices and responsibilities. That way of doing allows us to uh, improve uh, this, the relevance of the tool we make, but also to foster important conversations, uh, scientific con conversations concerning the methodological assumptions uh, that we embed in the tool we make. It also allows to create an environment, an open environment of tools, which correspond to each other. And to finish, I will just add that uh, one of, uh, so I present two of uh, the parts of the uh, of this environment, and one other, which is called Tessel, will be presented tomorrow by uh, Arnaud Pichon at length. Uh, and uh, I will end on that. Thank you. So uh, both, uh, ah yeah. So is this uh, available in uh, other languages than French? So both Hive Browser, Fonio, but also Ovid are bilingual in French and uh, English in their interface. Thank you. Thank you.